Uh, yeah, we're live. We went early. Um, it's okay. We're here. It's all good. I am going to share your presentation for you, but first I'd like to introduce you to everyone. Everyone, this is Yolanda Jafaris. She works with Madawa Glover at Chorus, and this is her thesis. This is the presentation that she used in order to get her master's degree. Chugs, I'm going to come off screen. I'm going to do the slides, okay? And then when you want me to go next, just say next, okay? Yep. Cool. And okay. we'll go. Yep. So hopefully, can you see that, or do I need to make that bigger? Um, if we go to present, I think was... Okay. So then I won't be able to see any of the comments. So you're going to have to talk to me through the audio because I won't be able to hear, see anything. Okay. 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 I'd better flick over. Right. There. Good. Yep. That's great. Thank you. Okay. You're welcome. Okay. So hi everyone. Thank you for joining me. My name's Yolan Jaffiers. Um, it, as Nancy said, I'm presenting my thesis research, which was vaping policy as a barrier or facilitator from a consumer perspective. A little bit about myself. I started off um, as a student, as a heavy smoker. Um, I wanted to cut back for my grandson, but nothing worked. Um, I found vaping, it was a bit edgy and I thought it might help me cut back and quit accidentally. I did a, a summer studentship with the Health Research Council where I looked into ethical issues related to vaping, uh, vaping research sorry, and that raised some concerns for me as to how vapors as consumers were being portrayed, which was often as naughty smokers who were using vaping to get around the rules. So I decided to go further and um, try to fairly represent the views of vapors as consumers, um, which was how my research came about. Thank you, Nancy. So a bit of background. Um, I would assume that it'll be common to many countries that, that we've progressed in very similar ways. At, at the time of my research, there were some specific myths that were drivers of fears um, around vaping and whether to take up vaping. Now, unfortunately, a lot of them still exist, and I, I hear much of this today. Uh, popcorn lung, I'm sure everyone is familiar with, which interestingly has never actually been scientifically linked to uh, the popcorn factories and diacetyl, that there just wasn't enough numbers to come to that conclusion. There is uh, a known link with organ transplant, however. Okay, youth epidemic and instant addiction is um, part of the scaremongering, but there's no evidence to support it. Many of us will be familiar with the um, study that concluded that um, there was a relationship between cardiac arrest and e-cigarettes. However, it wasn't mentioned that the cardiac arrest preceded the e-cigarette use, therefore it could not be causal. Um, framing nicotine as a highly addictive poison is, is a very common one worldwide. And unfortunately, you know, that's going to scare people. However, it's again not supported by research outside of smoking and it was also portrayed as illegal in New Zealand uh, when that was tested it proved not to be the case. Now the other one is the what we call the precautionary approach which is we don't know enough yet. Thank you Nancy. 
So with, with regards to ute vaping, there's the uh, 2019-ish snapshot of e-cigarette use. And there are a fair number of youth that have tried e-cigarettes. Um, I do have a child and adolescent psychology qualification, so this doesn't surprise me in the least. Uh, but there's only a small number of daily e-cigarette users, and almost all of those are also smokers or were smokers. So um, there has been research come out more recently, which is a bit more alarming, but this research overrepresented um, youth from higher socioeconomic areas. And we do know that the, are, they are more likely to vape, whereas those in the lower socioeconomic, lower decile schools are actually more likely to be smokers, uh, more likely to take up smoking than vaping. Hopefully that will change. Um, I, I know it worries us, but at the end of the day, vaping is safer than smoking. And we do want our youth to be as safe as possible if they're not going to avoid these things. It is for it being highly addictive for youth. Um, if they were mice, certainly there is evidence that that could be an issue. But again, it's not supported by evidence for human beings. Thank you. So as most of us will know, actually it's a, vaping is at least 95% safer than smoking. Um, there are no no known long-term negative health impacts, and we're not expecting those to be serious if they occur. Um, there are therapeutic benefits of nicotine, which from my perspective, um, look, looking at psychological aspects, um, I, f I find it very interesting and would like to look more into um, why particular groups use nicotine and, and how they may be using it in a beneficial way. It's not smoking, and, and I think we need to drum that message home. And it developed independently of big tobacco. Now, there's plenty of evidence for that. However, it is also true, and we do need to acknowledge this, that we really do not know enough yet. Thank you. One of my favourite quotes, um, Konstantinos, and he's explaining that it is true we don't know enough yet, um, but science has progressed a long way in terms of what we are able to look at and estimate likely harms. So, you know, we already have sufficient knowledge about the physical and chemical processes involved, the toxicology of emissions and biomarkers of exposure. There is no doubt that ends are much less harmful than smoking. This has been supported by count countless leading public health institutions from across the globe. Thank you. This was a really interesting one, again, for me. Um, framing nicotine addiction as a, as a moral failing it is a barrier to giving up smoking. And, and these are more the things that we need to look at in, in terms of resistance to making the switch. It, you know, we look a lot at the actual process, the vapes and the smoking behavior, but less we dig less into what may cause hesitance. So it was one of the main reasons that smokers were reluctant to take up vaping was concern over switching, switching one addiction for another. 
and the working class particularly experienced addiction as a moral failure by a loss of control and a neglect of their financial responsibilities. So, of course, when you have a higher income, um, this neglect of financial responsibilities is less of an issue. Thank you. Now, as was mentioned last night, for those who caught Dr. Glover's um, session, we had the Smoke Free Environments Act tested. This goes back to the belief that it was illegal in New Zealand to vape for quite some time. So we operated in what we called the grey market. Um, the Ministry of Health took uh, PMI to court and the judge ruled that actually it wasn't illegal at all. And given this, this advice, it can be said that the use of hates, well, it may have risks in itself, is not as harmful or potentially harmful as ordinary cigarette use. So what he's saying is it actually already fitted in to the purposes of our Smoke Free Environments Act and, and therefore trying to constrain it would go against the Act. Thank you. So the government response was to seek to constrain moral panic and a very, very strong focus on saving the children. I'm not sure how a lot of this stuff will save the children or is meant to, um, but there you go. So we need to save youth and non-smokers from imagined potential harms, remembering that there, there's been no established um, long-term harms from vaping. They ban banned vaping wherever smoking was banned which seems very counterproductive. Uh, Professor Beaglehole was um, very clear that we need to privilege vaping over smoking, but this seems to have fallen on deaf ears. Flavours perceived to be attractive to youth have now been restricted, so you cannot buy anything but mint, menthol and tobacco flavour in dairies, supermarkets, um, petrol stations and the like. They ha you have to go to a specialist vape store and you may or may not have access to one. So there are also now fines for vaping in cars where miners are present, which is a bit odd since they state that there's no bystander effect, so there's no real justification for the fine. Um, physical accessibility constraints, if you're in a rural area um, and, and you don't happen to have a credit card or internet capable card, then you're stuck with the tobacco, at least you can grow that at home. Obstruction of consumer advocacy in a gag order. Now, Nancy might like to jump in on this one. Um, um, yeah, I will actually. You won't see me, but I'll speak. I'll be the disembodied voice. Um, when the new Smoke Free Environments Act came into effect, it basically prevented um, AVCA from being able to do any of the community work that we used to do. For example, we had a Vape It Forward program, as, as Chugga knows. And, you know, in that program, we were able to help people switch from smoking to vaping. We can no longer do that because now any community work has to be done either under the supervision of a, what was it, a government approved smoking cessation provider and or must follow government approved protocol. So basically what they did is they outlawed community vapors helping vapors. And we tried to fight it and we got nowhere. So yeah, that is exactly what it did. It obstructed consumer advocacy on the community level, people to people. Thankfully, as well as being an advocate, I'm also a researcher, so I'm not quite so constrained. Um, 
certainly uh, Dr. Glover was very helpful in that respect. But they've also created a very complex set of regulatory requirements for the vaping companies themselves. And we've yet to fully see what that might mean um, for consumer access. Thank you. So I decided that we needed to actually hear more from vapors. Um, my time with the um, Health Research Council looking into ethics, one of my concerns was the way that, that vapors were being used. And, and it seemed as though researchers were getting vapors on board as participants and then presenting what they wanted to present to, to suit the researchers ideological position and that wasn't very fair so I wanted to try and um, accurately uh, reflect the voices of vapors. It was a small study because, because it was a master's research um, project uh, I did try and make sure it was as representative as possible, um, ethnic di diversity, income levels and locations particularly. Okay, thank you. So we had four vignettes or scenarios made up of in interview questions. The these were actually quite complex and descriptive so they were bullet pointed onto cards with the main points for the participants so that they didn't have to try and remember everything um, when responding and also instead of numbering them they were color coded so it didn't suggest any preference of um scenarios or policies whereas if, if you number one through to four five six that can be interpreted as a hierarchy so the participants were asked how they they uh, think that the actor might feel so so the person in the scenario was a smoker and they were asked to um say how they Think that person might think or feel in those situations which were all policy related and um, the interviews were recorded then transcribed for analysis and we used both inductive and deductive um, analysis um, the reason for that is because you know we had quite a set area we we were uh, looking to um research so but i wanted to leave room for new things to come up that we may not have otherwise known thank you so the policy variables it was a continuum of um advice from medical professionals information obtained by media how that was regulated access to vaping equipment and supplies how that was regulated cost considerations and in some cases there were legal repercussions one of the scenarios was actually based on uh, queensland so there were some pretty strong legal uh, repercussions in that case thank you findings now this is what we found was that policy that affirms vaping as a much safer alternative to smoking acts as a behavioral change motivator so this facilitates uh, the change from smoking to vaping policy that casts vaping in a negative light acts as a barrier to behavioural change away from smoking and towards vaping. Now both of those we'd fully expect. The other one was that policy that results in contradictory or confused messages about 
vaping acts as a barrier to behavioural change. Now, what this means is we need very strong, clear, positive messages um, and, and less um, conflicting information. So if, if there's negative information, on average, you need 10 positive mes messages to counter that negative messaging. And this leaves people just, just stuck in a no man's land. Individual differences, however, will act as moderators between the three positions. And I think this can be very helpful for us if we learn to, um, and, and I think advocates such as Evka have done very, very well with this, is to learn who the person is, what their situation is, the way they roll, and, and adjust their advice to that, rather than trying to use the standard uh, formula to try and get them to switch from smoking to vaping. Thank you, Nancy. So direct barriers to changing smoking behaviour, policies that result in restrictions and prohibitions can put people off, and also requirements that are cumbersome and increase burden. So uh, this is from our participants. I'm afraid that if the government decides to place an excise tax on them, then motivation might lessen. And um, it was quite an interesting how costs worked out. It wasn't a um, straightforward, yes, if it's cheaper, we'll do it. Okay, so next one. In my point of view, James would not take up vaping for the fact of possible fines. Now, <laughs> that's exactly what we've got is the started to um, introduce fines with vaping in cars with minors. And I say starting to because it became apparent that um, the goal here was actually to systematically um, eradicate the use of nicotine. So it, it, it shifted from smoking to nicotine generally. And there was a very, very clear indicator that this was just the first step. So another participant, vaping products only legal from pharmacies and licensed vape stores. That could discourage me from starting because I know I can access cigarettes in every dairy supermarket and BP station. And unfortunately, we very near, nearly have that scenario because there's only three flavours that you're able to get in the places where you buy the cigarettes, and that's mint, menthol, and tobacco. Thank you. So facilitators to change from smoking to vaping. Now, the, the, this is the goal, so it, it's the important part is policies that serve to remove barriers and change smoking behaviour. So the support of health professionals, but I think that's brilliant too. So really strong message from health professionals that vaping is a positive step forward and is likely to be very helpful. She'll just do it with out all that horrible guilt being put on her. And th this is, again, in many places, it's a common thing is um, we've ostracized, marginalized um, our, our smokers. We make them feel guilty for smoking. And to relieve that, it is a positive step forward but to do that we need to keep framing vaping in a positive light and um, if the products are readily available including dairies I would probably say that Nigel would probably go for it 
and see if he likes it. We didn't end up with a lot in the dairies, unfortunately, but maybe we can see a bit of movement there as time goes on. Thank you, Nancy. So inertia. Um, now, this, this is where people just don't know what to do, so they do nothing. They, they continue the behaviour while they wait and see. So there, there's different reasons. Um, sometimes, I mean, I'm very much in the view that sometimes, you know, we get too much choice. So this is when information overload can, can um, be a strong contributor to inertia. And I think we're actually seeing that a lot at the moment with the COVID situation where, where information accurate or otherwise is being thrown at people from all directions and we get people just left sitting there going I don't know I'll wait so again I feel like old Paula won't know what to do and but again you know people are saying look don't do it you just don't know which direction you've been told is the right direction and this was a problem particularly when we had a free-for-all situation uh, how it will pan out now when we've got a gag order in place that stops our strongest advocates actually um, communicating we'll have to wait and see thank you Nancy Individual differences as mediators. So th this is where if we get a good understanding of how people's individual circumstances and individual way of being um, affect their decision making, uh, we can probably be more helpful to them. So probably the big part for me would be depending on his age so we're talking about technology and loopholes and whether someone's willing to jump through those so a younger person in, in the view of this participant would be more likely to jump through those loopholes and learn all about the new technology whereas if they were older they'd probably be a bit more resistant Unless you're kind of one of those who like to stay on the edge of that law, I'm not. So when we put laws in place, it doesn't necessarily mean that people will stop um, their course of action in order to remain within the law. So we're potentially putting people in the situation of being lawbreakers to save their lives. Um, and an example of that would be accessing flavours, if that's what works for them, um, but not having access to a, a brick and mortar vape store or online access to them. So the next one, and, and maybe she just won't, oh no, sorry, back. And, and maybe she won't have the ability or capacity to find that information. Now, again, this is a problem with information overload and a lot of conflicting information. Some people will be able to sift through that and analyse the data and draw objective conclusions, but not everyone can. And I have no doubt, unless Mandy absolutely loves smoking, she would definitely start vaping with this kind of environment behind her or she's in. Now, this was a um, pro-vaping environment, but the difference here was that Mandy might actually love smoking, in, in which case the environment won't matter. And there are people that just smoke because they enjoy it. Thank you. 
so well, I thought I'd do a comparison between um, government and consumer responses, which I, I thought was really interesting, given that vapors had actually been framed as these radicals who were breaking all the rules and just naughty smokers. Now, the government's response to the situation was to state that we support vaping in keeping with the scientific evidence. However, in action, they have not made that clear. Um, they've included it in the Smoke Free Environments Act and done so in a way that treats it like smoking. In some instances, there's actually more regulation and more restriction on vaping than there is on smoking. So there's bans, penalties, health warnings, and um, no information whatsoever about potential therapeutic benefits. So oh, of nicotine, sorry, not not of the vaping itself. And vapors as consumers, what I found was that they actually were very pragmatic, very realistic, and very sensible. So sure, sh on board with age restrictions and accurate health information. Now, they're also on board with basic safety measures to regulate what we're getting in our e-liquids and um, the safe devices. And mixed messages, their, their message was that mixed messages and punitive approaches are likely to act as barriers to changing smoking behaviour. Thank you. So here we have our long list of <laughs> references, um, which will be online. Thank you, Nancy. And I'd particularly like to thank Dr. Penelope Truman from Massey University, who was my supervisor, the wonderful Marewa Glover from the Centre of Research Excellence in Digital Sovereignty and Smoking, and Knowledge Action Chain, or KAC. Now, I, I do work for the centre now and Knowledge Action Change, uh, both funded from uh, the Foundation for the Smoke-Free World. However, I've, I've never um, obtained any funding from tobacco or vaping companies and, and those are my only um, funding sources. Thank you. Right. Any questions? I'm back. Okay. Anyone know of any studies that state how much e-liquid a vapor goes through using an open system? Did you run into any of that? I I found lots of gaps. Um, I don't think there was any average. <laughs> I yeah. didn't. Uh, I yeah. think because you know. Open systems, it depends on whether you're a mouth to lung vapor or you're a direct to you know lung vapor. I mean, a direct to lung is going to go through a lot more e liquid than a mouth to lung. Um, same with nicotine, the different yeah. levels of nicotine. It's kind of difficult to suss it, I think. And I think there's a problem with averages there when, when you're um, dealing with a very diverse population, is yeah, an, an average can be two extremes and represent neither because yeah. Yeah, <laughs> low, very low use, very high use, and we come up with an average figure in the middle, um, which is relevant to neither. Yeah, it kind of ties into what uh, another thing that Marua was talking about yesterday about with, with the tribes, you know, the different tribes that, okay, we, we, we lump everyone together and then, you know, we don't have the specifics on older people, younger people, indigenous people, Pakiha people, mouth to lung, so on and so forth. I mean, that's some, that would be something that would be really interesting to see. Although with the WHO telling people, you know, telling countries and signatories to ban open tanks. Um, interesting. It, everybody it doesn't is, make sense to me. Um, everybody's giving you the love, by the way. You did amazing. Oh, and I'm you. very proud thank of you. you. I'm like a proud parent. I'm so proud of you. We've come so far from kicking, from pushing that professor to quit his job. <laughs> it's a long story behind that. We don't that talk anymore. about that anymore. <laughs> um, 
let me ask you something though. In in your study, when you were doing this, I'm going yes. to guess that the Nick salts weren't really prevalent or weren't really around much. Did you find anything with regards to the differences between free base nicotine and nic nicotine salts? There were, nicotine salts were around. Um, I may have actually been using nicotine salts myself by then because you know because because I like yeah. to test things, but they they weren't there wasn't differentiation at the time um, in, in terms of looking at policy and stuff like that. There wasn't any differentiation between salts and nicotine, so it was still very early days, and they were very complicated scenarios so to go and throw something else in there yeah. um it was just a bit too much yeah no i understand i'm just giving you ideas for the research down the line yes you, yes yes <laughs> good for that um lots of ideas speaking of that um what i would really like to do because although we're talking to vapors there's a voice missing there and and that mm -hmm. is that of the smokers themselves. Yeah. Yeah. People who smoke are very much key stakeholders here. And I think we need to spend um, more time listening to them. Um, we're, we're doing that with the voices study. Um, mm -hmm. But particularly in, in terms of what they think would be yeah. most helpful for them. Of, of course, it's a bit more difficult because it's speculative. Yeah. Um, yeah. Whereas the vapors were able to look back in hindsight. Every single one of mine was a former smoker. Mm -hmm. I, I didn't encounter any that had never smoked before. So they were able to draw upon their experience in hindsight. But I do think that we need to um, bring the smokers in on the conversation. And, and expand it. And I think, you know, culture comes into it a lot as well. So from country to country, it's likely to vary. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, but if, yeah. I'm so proud of you. I'm just sitting here looking at you smiling. <laughs> yeah. I'm just proud I, of you. I, I can't, I'm just noticing Marewa was asking about the yes. Health Research Council summer students. Please. But, okay. <laughs> So this was a really interesting one. Um, I, d I decided I will look into um, ethical issues in vaping research on, on the part of the researchers. Now, I must be clear, there, there were some really, really good people doing vaping research. It, it wasn't all bad. And... Um, Good acknowledgement, you know, one, one springs to mind, they were using, um, they were supplying vaping equipment uh, to test the efficacy and see how well it worked and very quick to say, look, you know, it's totally dependent on the type of the cigarette we were supplying, um, so may not be representative. On the other hand, um, and, and most were actually very happy to let me review their studies and their ethics process. Not everyone, though. Mm. We did have to request information under the Official Information Act from a certain um, research group at a certain... The usual um, suspects? In, yeah, institution. Yeah, okay. Um, and even with that request, I was obliged to put into my um, report that I was unable to uh, evaluate the ethics because they did not supply the required information. <laughs> At, at the time, they waited until after the, I'd done and, and then sent it, hugely redacted, of course. Of course. So, you know, that, that, that's a bit of a concern. Um, if people aren't happy to have their work evaluated, um, I, I think we should be asking why. 
we can ask why, but it doesn't mean we're going to get an answer either. You know that. No, but <laughs> I think it should be raised. And then there was, you know, the whole Twitter. <laughs> yes. yes. Let, let, let's just let's just take everyone's comments um, and, and use them as we see fit to characterize them. Mm -hmm. I mean, but, you know, these are people... I feel bad we're talking. It's like me calling you know who Voldemort. It's like we got to come up with a name for them too. Um, it, when you were talking about people, you know, it, there's this, this theme that's been running for the past couple of months is meeting people where they are. And that relates to vapors and that relates to smokers. And that also relates to research, you would think. You know, um, Roberto was talking somewhat of it this morning. Um, there's a certain ethical and, and you have to, you know, argue your case, like you had to argue for your, your masters, right? You have to defend your thesis. It seems that there are certain factions within the tobacco or public health, tobacco control, let's just say, that feel that they're above and beyond that and they don't need to do that. And somehow they're getting away with it. It, it does happen, and then, of course, we have other people that just get slammed no matter what they do <laughs> at the yeah. other end of that scale. Um, as Marie was just pointed out, I, I didn't raise the issue of um, vapors as a vulnerable population. Now, this, this would be a way to address um, how them being used in research as opposed to being participants in research yeah it they are vulnerable um it, it's a difficult time of life we're, we're talking about um nicotine dependency and how, how to address their health issues so in, in ethics we have different rules for vulnerable populations and we have to take greater care Mm -hmm. and, and certainly, if, if we class vapors as a vulnerable population, and smokers too, people mm -hmm. who smoke, um, that would go a long way towards uh, addressing. It, it won't fix it because some people are going to do what they're going to do. Mm -hmm. um, but it certainly could help the way they're treated. Yeah, I agree. I mean, it's a shame that we actually have to classify people as vulnerable because oh, they don't get I, equal treatment. But, you know, we could go on for days on that. So we're not going yeah. there right now. No. Um, we've got people commenting. I know. Can you see the comments? Um, people are commenting about how much they use. Um, this is a good comment from Mark. I know many smokers that won't try vape because TVNZ, bad reports of vapors getting popcorn lung and how e-cigs are worse than regular cigarettes. And it's sad. I wonder, I don't know if you've, if you've approached this or analyzed this, I wonder why the government, which allegedly is supportive of vaping, is allowing all of this in the media. Got any ideas on that? Well, I think this might go back to um, when I was um, presenting my submission to <laughs> the House Select Committee, and right before I went on, um it was it was made very clear that the goal was actually to get rid of all forms of nicotine use yeah yeah whether it starts to change because it's not um in accord with the message from uh, approved message mm. <laughs> hmm. i yeah. i have a feeling that a lot's going to f fly below the radar in terms of negative reporting, um, but positive reporting that's not entirely aligned might be pulled up be because that <laughs> would be more consistent with what, what was stated about wanting to get rid, rid of nicotine use. Now, yeah. this, this is the problem. Um, these sorts of conflicts Conflicts aren't just in the information you give, it, it, it's also in your behavior. So when you say, yes, we're pro-vaping, it can help you to ditch the cigarettes, and then you either 
behave differently or allow others to behave differently, it sends a mixed message. And, yeah. and that's where you get people stuck. Yeah, the cognitive dissonance. Yeah. Um, Matawa, some of the participant information sheets that you obtained did not disclose that the researchers were openly and publicly anti-vaping. Maybe potential participants would not have signed up if they had known. I think actually that was very likely the case. Um, I, I didn't get to look at this until later. Um, they played very, very nicely with the um, vapors that, that were in their studies. And this comes down to the definition of conflict of interest. Now, as, as researchers, we have to state our conflicts of interest. And we had had a particular group just stating that they had no conflict of interest. Yeah. There was commercial interest. Yes. Um, with a competing product that was found mm -hmm. and of course there's ideology so uh, you know the anti-vaping crowd <laughs> yeah um that that same institution we really need to come up with a name for them yolanda we got to work on that um they when they were doing a lot of their they're, they're seeking to make friends with vapors and um jan and i went to a public health seminar that they held and you know I'll never forget this, that one of the people who initials are RE stood up in front of everybody and basically bashed another advocacy group thinking it was Jan and I sitting in the audience and thought it was perfectly okay. I wasn't even allowed <laughs> to attend. I'm not allowed in there anymore. No, we all, the, it was what last year they turned around. We, we, we registered like we always did for every, you know, every yeah. summer school that we went to. And we were told that we couldn't because of article 5.3 and Jan and I just looked and I got angry. I got angry. I was like, article, why are you throwing article 5.3 at me? I'm not a government entity. You're not a government entity. What is this about? It was, and what it was, um, we found out later was that, uh, a certain um, researcher who worked with that certain a certain individuals at that certain university, this is so sc scary that I have to say it this way, had actually added us through the University of Bath onto tobacco tactics because we went to the GFN. So they're really stretching, you know, they're really yeah. reaching yeah. Um, to exclude as many people as they possibly can for whatever reason they possibly can. So, you know, yeah. guilty, you know, guilty until proven innocent instead of the other way around. So, um, what do you see going forward? I mean, if you had the chance, Chugs, right now, and you could talk to the delegates at the COP9, what would you say to them? I, I would say that actually they need to let key stakeholders in on the conversation and, and they need to learn to listen and understand and take into account, um, people who vape and people who smoke. Um, have a wealth of knowledge and insight to share that could actually help us solve this problem, which should be the objective. Yeah. And just shutting people out it is not going to help. We, we need these products. They're working. Okay. Yeah. And yes, we don't know 50 years down the track when I'm 192. Yeah, it might give me an eye twitch. <laughs> It might. You know, first world problems. Yeah. Um, but what I do know is here and now, we're healthier yeah. because we were able to make that switch from smoking to vaping. And, and we should be giving every person, as a matter of right, the, the opportunity to do so. Great, completely. I mean, it's, it, you know, we've talked about this a lot in CAFR meetings and, and here too, you know, it, it's a battle, but it's a long haul. Um, and there's slow, you know, and you get two steps forward, you know, one step forward and two steps back and one step forward and two steps back. I think we may, like I told this, I said this last night, Madawa just looked at me, she probably thinks I'm nuts, but that's okay. I think we'll get there, but it's going to take a really long time, you know? Um, and I agree with, you know, Madawa here. She's saying, you know, we need more people who vape to be running their own studies or, or involved in research products, projects as co-investigators and advisor. Yes. And yes, you are very, very lucky to have Chugga on your team. Absolutely, Madawa. I, I think I'm very lucky to um, be on the team. I, I, I feel um, very privileged. 
Um, in terms of your optimism, I'm more cynical. I know. Um, <laughs> Far more cynical would be probably the mm. right term, but that's not the point. The, the point to me is there's both a moral and ethical obligation yeah. to continue irrespective of, of whether there's likely to be a positive outcome or not. You know, people's lives are at stake and we need to try no matter how hopeless it might look, it's not looking yeah. good at the moment. We've got researchers being shut out. Yeah. Um, we've got advocates being shut out. Yeah, but, you know, on the other hand, um, <laughs> and this is probably where my optimism comes from. I mean, I'm seeing some positive stuff in Asia. Yes. And that kind of gives me hope, you know. Um, and also what with Mexico with the heated, you know, with the e-cigarette, the lifting of that import. So, like I said, one step forward, two steps back. I, as long as we're getting the one step forward, I can deal with the two steps back. Yeah. Um, I mean, you know, if you had said to me three years ago that, you know, Malaysia would actually, you know, regulate and legalize, I would have been like, <laughs> I, same with the Philippines, right? I mean, in the Philippines, yeah. is almost there. Malaysia is pretty much there. Um, you know, it, it's 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 interesting to see. And I'm, I don't know how much of the cop you've been following, um, you know, the reports that are coming out. And yesterday, you know, the FCA, the Framework Convention Alliance, gave the Philippines the Dirty Ashtray Award because they backed up the UK on harm reduction, tobacco harm reduction. And they refused to agree to the agenda because they, they were told, you know, we're not talking about this. We're not having these, you know, these discussions. You said they deferred until, you know, COP10. So all countries are, are starting to get, you know, feisty let's put it that way with oh, it's good and that's a good thing that's a good thing chaga yes <laughs> uh, the dirty ashtray yeah, yeah the dirty ashtray award we we have the the bugger award at fishing you know okay. for, for pe people there but it's all in good fun you you put a dirty yeah that's disgusting it's also it's bullying just, yes it, it's and, disgraceful yeah. behavior. It's unprofessional. I agree. Isn't it yeah. funny how they're not held to the same professional standard as everybody else? I know. And and um, I I yeah you know, I keep racking my brain for how we're going to solve this problem because because this really is the big hurdle. Is the FT. Uh, FCTC. FCTC. It's yeah. getting to the, it, it, it's, it's people, it's, it, and of course it's hard now because it's COVID, but it's the face to face, you know, um, it's being able to humanize it. You see a person standing in front of you. They may have this idea in their head of, you know, it's some kind of bogan or some, you know, fringe person that is a vapor, right? Um, and then they see, you know, somebody like you or I standing in front of them and like, oh, wait a minute. So it's the humanization of it. And it's also, I think, it's how we represent like when I'm representing myself, I don't think about me representing myself. I'm representing everybody who does the same that I do all the vapors, you know? Um, so what I'm doing is going to reflect upon them. So I think it's, it, it's almost like the advocacy has to go through some growing pains to be able to have those discussions with people and, and break through those barriers, you know, like the 5.3 that I've been dealing with here in New Zealand or, you know, just the general, we don't want to know. We're going to give you a dirty ashtray award. It, it's 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 just a consistency, stubbornness. Um, yeah. Blind determination. Blind determination, yeah. Um, I'd rather say, I would rather people said I was determined than stubborn, but if they call me stubborn, that's okay too. Um, what do you think? I, I am wondering if we might see generational changes. Um, that, you know, one of, one of the things that really interested me because of my child and adolescent psychology bent um, was the misinformation being ditched at adolescence, yeah. it, which is on the one hand marketing vaping to them, but also on the other hand ridiculous. We know yeah, you and I had that discussion when they came out with that. They were going to do that. Um, the, the, that other organization that needs its own name wanted yeah. to do that little website about you know 
teaching kids that vaping was bad. And we were like, well, if, if it was me, my 14 year old self, and you told me something was bad, I'd be like, that would be the first thing I would do. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, it's um, exactly. It's not only that is that they have access. Adolescents are very te technology savvy and mm -hmm. um, they're taught to research in schools online. Yeah and to assess information so if the adults are feeding them unbelievable bs yeah yeah um that is not just more likely to encourage them to vape especially when you're saying all their friends are doing it yeah um it, it's also likely to prompt them to access the facts uh, more objective facts not just um, that particular narrative and we may see that that generation comes through mm -hmm. it, and they become the ones that actually make the difference well they're not entrenched in the quit or die no no you know i mean and that's what a lot of this is is you know you've got a lot of mid it's let me let me try to formulate this you've got a lot of mid-career people or people that are just waiting you know to retire right with their pension that are holding on steadfastly to the quit or die and then you've got the people that have actually their careers are pretty much for the most part over now coming out and admitting that you know what we were we were wrong you know we you know, the, the hundred people with clive that you know sent the letter to the who so yeah but how long i mean we're talking 20 30 years we may see it before we cark it i don't know i'm hoping we do well yeah there was a really interesting situation with my grandson at school um someone had been vaping in in the changing rooms after or before pe i'm not sure which um okay. and and they do know that i'm an advocate so yeah, and the f first person whose bag got checked was my grandson's. Um, he didn't. He didn't have a bag, <laughs> but yeah. they seemed a bit disappointed. Um, and then the teacher proceeded to lecture the kids about how their lungs are going to shrivel up because of all the oil. So of course my grandson felt morally obliged of course he did. He's <laughs> to your grandson. misinformation mm -hmm. and point out yeah. that that's actually not true mm -hmm. um yeah you know, my advice to him is, is i i don't have a major issue with you vaping and um, mm -hmm. I, I i think it's better than the smoking but my advice to my grandson was um you know one, it's against the school rules to have a vape, so that's mm -hmm. that. But also, um, when you initiate something, there's the potential to become dependent. It can affect your mood and concentration at school if you don't have it. So yeah. if you're going to vape, it'd be really mm -hmm. cool to have no nicotine. Um, but I give them all the information because I do not want to be in a position where I've betrayed his trust. Hmm. Yeah, um, no, I understand that. You know, I mean, I dealt with it too when I was still living in Masterton and um, there were kids vaping at, at the school, at the college, you know, and my daughters, you know, because they live with me. And, you know, like Christian, um, they have no <laughs> problem speaking their mind and telling the truth. Yeah. You know, it, it's... It, it, the culture of fear, you know, let's instill fear in the kids to keep them in line. It doesn't work with these kids. So yeah. you're better off just telling them the truth. And, and you know, they, I would rather, and I'm like you, I mean, I don't condone underage vaping as underage vaping, but by the same yeah. token, like you, the kids that are vaping for the most part would be the kids that would be smoking. So if I, I have to look at harm, you know, and I think we need to look at more why the kid, those kids are vaping and smoking. Um, and from um, to understand it, we, we tend not to take the time to understand the phenomena. We, we go in with a judgment. And 
you know, there's a lot of research around neurodiversity and yes. in, in particular, the kids are most likely to be smoking early and gravitate towards it are, are kids who go on to be diagnosed with ADHD. Now, you know, th there's research showing that nicotine has beneficial impacts for mm -hmm. adults. We haven't, uh, to my knowledge, we haven't studied children, but adults with ADHD, it, it helps mm -hmm. manage their system. So we may actually be seeing um, a, a form of self-awareness mm -hmm. that, that we're just so hell-bent on it's wrong that we're not taking the time to understand and see what's going on because you know understanding can help us provide a safer way to achieve the same mm -hmm. yeah no i so, agree I, yeah i mean you know there was a discussion um and i think patrick on son of liberty is talking about this today neurodiversity and nicotine we yeah. kind of got into it a little bit last night when we were talking about using it to self-medicate. Um, I know I do. I know most advocates, you know, that I know that I'm friends with, they would tell you the very same thing. And I also know, yeah, hello. And I also know that a lot of us women are walking around undiagnosed ADHD and ADD. And dyslexia too is another one. Um, uh, yeah, like, I don't like these terms. I don't either. I don't like labels. But I mean, I, you know, it, yeah. Yeah, it, it, we, there was a time when being left-handed was considered a disability. Yeah, yeah and, I know. Until we <laughs> learn to let them use their left hand. Yeah, <laughs> I'm... I was one of those kids that my first grade teacher was an ex-nun and I started writing with my left hand and, and she whacked me with a ruler and I used my right hand for stuff. I mean, I still use my left hand for some stuff. But yeah, I was one of the kids that went through that. So yeah, I understand. So um, that, that's all that cognition stuff fascinates me. And and we don't think of the consequences. You know, the whole brain's geared up. If you're left-handed, the whole brain's geared up for you to be really left-handed. So when you take that and you mess with it and force them to try and be a right-handed person, there's all sorts of unseen negative impacts of that. So what they were saying is, look, that you know, um, all these left-handed people, um, they're likely to be criminals. You know, they're poor learners. So it, it's it's a sign that there's something wrong with them. And instead of looking at the fact that it was how we were treating them that caused the outward yeah. expressions that they were using to characterize them as broken. And, and I think it's very much the same with the likes, what we're calling ADHD, which I call stress, uh, otherwise not specified. <laughs> Because yeah, because we're more sensitive to things. So it creates a much, we're, we're, we're living on cortisol. Yeah. Yeah. Because we don't yep. fit in. It's kind of like um, out of sync, slightly out of sync. Uh, dyslexia, which I call being visual spatial. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. 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 No, it's, and, it's, 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 it's interesting. Yeah. So, so, the, so there's a whole tangent, I, I think, and until we really look into that, um, and really understand we need to recognize, acknowledge, and adapt to differences. Yes. And, yes. and then I think we'll see some, <laughs> it's almost like the more tolerant we see ourselves as a society, uh, the more judgmental we become about those who are perceived to be different uh, different yeah <laughs> so different. it's like we'll include all you but we're going to punish you lot twice as much there always has to be a scapegoat there has to be a scapegoat and when yeah. you really think about it true inclus inclusivity means there's no scapegoat you know um mm. I'm going to ask you a question. Um, how are you enjoying doing your interviewing for the voices for the 5%? I am loving it. it, Hello. it I, I've, honestly, I feel so privileged the, um, what these people share with us. They, um, 
Yeah, it, it's some. I mean, some of the stories are heartbreaking. You know, mm. That there really is um, some some real hardship and trauma. Mm-hmm. Um, and and you know, I, I think one of, one of the things that stuck with me is being treated like lepers. Oh, but I can see as why, smokers. Yeah. Yeah, so so there's that side of it, but they are just so generous um, w- with sharing their lives, and and I think this is what we need to we need to rehumanize people who smoke. Yeah, that that they've been othered for so long that that we've forgotten by human beings. And, and this is where I think we get away with so much of the atrocious uh, discrimination. You know, a smoker, you can be turned down for a house because you smoke or employment. Yeah, that's insane. It's insane. <laughs> Especially um, when it's not first because you were a smoker once. Yes, exactly. Um, you know, but for the grace of God, <laughs> or whichever ha- higher power you choose, or non higher power. Yeah, no. Um, um, yeah, but yeah, you know, they're just so wonderful with their time, and and it's so diverse. It's like I I couldn't come away from that and say, well, actually. <laughs> mm-hmm. Yeah, no, I understand what you're saying. Yeah, so um, many different stories. I do really, really recommend that um, people look at the uh, Voices for the 5%. Has the link gone in? Mm. Um, maybe someone can pop the link. Ottawa, can you put up the link for the Voices for the 5%? I read them. I read them sometimes and I can see myself in some of them. And I can see people I know in some of them. And yeah, it you know, it's just humanization. I think we've become dehumanized. I really do. Yes. Yeah, yeah. And, yeah. And I think particularly this is somewhere where um, as, as researchers, we, we need to be very careful not to lose sight of, of the fact that these are human beings. They aren't our study subjects. <laughs> are they not just statistics? Yeah, yeah, they're, they're not. A, right these are real human beings. Um, and and. Thank you. And well, yeah, take the time. And I think this is a bit of a problem in the vaping community as well. Um, mm-hmm. I, I, I've seen some othering. Yeah, we're going to discuss that tonight on the panel. Um, I want to seriously address the othering of people who use heated tobacco and snus. Because. Well, or smoke, yeah. but you know, I mean, to, tobacco can yeah. be safer. Yeah. So I'm discussing safer, but um, I'm not discussing very low nicotine cigarettes because I'm not convinced. But um, you know, I, I I want you know if we're gonna if you want something for yourself, you know, you also have to think about the person next to you, and you have to bring them along with you. It's not just about you. No, that's and, right. You know, in Northern Asia, heated tobacco is the go. I may not like it. I may not want it, but that isn't giving me the right to turn around and tell them they can't have it. If it works and they're not smoking and they don't want to smoke, then that's a great thing. And harm reduction is harm reduction. (laughs) Exactly. Um, So Uh, othering is a problem. Um, I also think one of the problems we're having, and and this is a personal observation rather Mm -hmm. than a professional one, is commercial interests um, that that are a, another form of um, conflict of interest taking over what was once a very people orientated industry. Well, it was a fledgling industry. It was a barely an in industry, but it was all about the people. Yeah, I've had that discussion here with. Um the resident uh, juice maker and video editor. And, um, you know, yeah, it's, it used to be a community. It used to be people would help each other. It used to be, and then the money got involved and it became so commercialized and it became so, it, it, it they lost track of what they got into it for. Yeah. And isn't that funny and what the common denominator is, Chaga? 
Yeah. yeah. Um, particular, well, one that's really got my attention is the quite a few companies refusing to sell anything higher than six milligram nicotine. Yeah, I don't get that. I, you know, if you're on a mouth to lung kit, um, competitive. Thanks, Mato. Neither one of us could find the word, but Mato <laughs> gave us the word. It's competitive. Thank you. <laughs> um, choice. It's all about choice. You know that. I've had this, you know, I've been writing about this for what, four years now, five years. People need choice because everybody's different and the limiting of things is not going to help. No, it's not. Well, yeah, if, if a company's not prepared to sell higher than six milligram, my first thing would be to say maybe you should consider whether that company doesn't have people's best interests at heart. Um, that will get you going back for a lot more juice. <laughs> Sorry, e coach. It depends. I mean, you know, what I'm seeing is a lot of people are going to Nick Salt's. Um, there's not that many people doing freebase anymore. I mean, I'm one of the last out I, that I know of that, you know, I'm using an open tank system of freebase. A lot of people here are now on Nick salts and pods. Um, I would, I'm worried that we're going to wind up with a Nick salt industry, a Nick salt market. And then I'm screwed because I can't use Nick salts. See, and that's the flip side of this, you know, right. yeah. limiting choice is never a good thing ever. Yeah. Um, all right. Well, you know what? We did it. You did it. <laughs> we are all really proud of you. Um, and I didn't say one rude word. <laughs> no, you didn't. I mean, hello. I think we finally grew up. Um, uh, thank you, Chaga. Yeah, it's just when you get so stressed. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks, everybody, for joining us. And thank you, I everyone. will talk to you. And we've got a panel on tonight, haven't we? Yes, we do. It's the ladies' panel. It's the estrogen panel. It's all girls. <sighs> So yeah i'll be in. in the audience yay <laughs> <laughs> all right guys i'll see you thank you